Hi everyone, welcome to Space ML. Today we will be talking about how to conduct open source research by bringing in citizen scientists from around the world for the advancement of space technology for NASA. My name is Anirudh Kaul, and I'm here with my awesome collaborators, Siddha Ganju, Meher Kasam, and James Parr. And I did just want to mention that the tilt on the faces you are seeing on the slide, the more the tilt, the more the visionary factor. Well, James is the founder of Frontier Development Labs, which we'll be just talking about shortly. So for today, our plan is to talk about the background, what Frontier Development Labs is, how do we measure impact with technology readiness levels, what space ML is, what we learned through our uh, mistakes and learnings, and finally, some case studies. And finally, how can you contribute to space ML? So talking about Frontier Development Labs, this is a uh, this is kind of like a startup accelerator for which, which mixes AI and space sciences. So back in 2014, FTL was conceived by the Office of Chief Technologist at NASA headquarters. And this is like the Apollo era of interdisciplinary research. You bring people from diverse backgrounds out of their silos, bringing them together, usually pairing two researchers from the AI side with two researchers on the space sciences side combining them together to solve a problem which hasn't been explored or just seems to be something which is high value but high risk. That's exactly what FTL does. And then put them in a startup accelerator-like environment. You have eight weeks in the summertime to prove a problem. You pick goals which are safe, stretch, and moonshot, and just then try to aim for that moonshot. And then you get an access to a set of mentors who are subject matter experts who will guide you along the way. Uh, and hopefully that benefits everyone. So we bring this research talent, give them challenges and data, and then finally some commercial help, uh, especially compute in kind credits. And in the last five years of FTL, most of these teams that have worked during the summer have produced almost always a research publication, and then sometimes a data product or a tool, and even sometimes commercial partnerships. In the last five years, as you can see on the slide, there are a lot of big numbers you can see. The acceptance rate of this program has become pretty picky, about 5%, uh, because of the results these researchers have been churning out, uh, getting best paper awards at certain conferences. Uh, the diversity of the teams is pretty good, even though we have more work to do. Uh, but the amount of network that we have been able to build of research alumni uh, to help out. Uh, and finally, the help from our sponsors who have donated compute credits in kind. And the researchers who have burned that compute credit almost $2.6 million worth of shows the amount of research that has been churning out. And this is great. And by the way, check out the Robert Downey Jr documentary on this very topic of Frontier Development Labs. It has 45 million views. So this is great, but could we do even for, could we go further than this? Now there's a famous phrase that if you can't measure something, you cannot improve it and we need to measure it. Luckily, NASA has a way of measuring your things with something called technology readiness levels, TRL. It's a scale from one to nine where one is, hey, there's a basic principle observed whereas nine is it's deployed in mission critical system at scale. So what does happen to projects that usually come out of FTL? Well, normally for everyone, when things come out as a research paper, you are excited, I'm excited, but that's level three. It's exciting, but on a scale of impact you could potentially make, there are places to go. And so the aim we should keep is what can we do to bring it to level nine, right? That's the question we are asking. Can we take these papers from level three and add things to it to bring it closer and closer to level nine? And that's what Space ML is attacking. Space ML is trying to bring people beyond the researchers we had in the summer, so bringing in citizen scientists, up leveling them and making them attack these problems that can potentially, instead of taking years to get to the end, take months to get to that high level in TRL scale. So we bring in some input. So think of projects that ended at FTL in those eight weeks. We asked researchers who worked in the eight weeks, 
if you had just two more weeks, what is something you could have tackled? If you had four weeks, if you had two months, if you had six months, and we get a wish list from those projects of potential to-dos that could have actually helped those projects get to that TRL9 level. We obviously get help from Academia and uh, partners at NASA and ESA and technology partners like Google Cloud. And then we bring in our citizen scientists. Well, citizen scientists might not actually have a PhD or a postdoc. They might actually be a high schooler, but who is dedicated at contributing. So uh, we take them through an educational setup curriculum built for them. Once they have up leveled, we give them the problem to work on. Hopefully that problem is a bite-sized problem that they can chew and work on. And once they have, and we give them a mentor, and once they have done enough uh, uh, contribution, we try to make that contribution into a proper tool that people can use and then experiment further. And as they go through that, some of, if they start beating the state of the art, we try to publish them as models as well as data products. And eventually, once they have reached a level, we try to bring them in a community, a monthly community of experts in that particular area where they get to present it in front of uh, people who they might not usually have the reach to uh, and showcase their work um, and hopefully have people who can help promote their work in their own research. So we did this and we learned a few things and what was the secret sauce behind getting things running before we get to the case studies? Well, we learned a few things. First of all, you need to upskill people depending on their background. Everybody's different. Some people have an AI background, some people don't have. So you need to give them a curriculum fitting their particular problem that they would be working on. So we, we give people uh, an upskilling uh, curriculum, depending on who they are. And then they need to show their competency in that. So we give them a mini challenge to solve, uh, depending on the project that we think that they will eventually be working on. And also to see their dedication. Once they have done that, we give them a bite-sized problem. Usually by bite-sized, we mean that a competent developer could have built an MVP, a prototype in under three weeks. And three weeks is a great time because I'm not talking about a full product. I'm talking about develop the prototype. When you try developing a prototype, chances are things might not work and there might be enough amount of improvements that you need to make. So a three week prototype would actually eventually be a three month to four month project because you try to polish it and do a lot more. But three weeks is like the right amount we have found. Obviously we give them mentorship during this uh, time. Uh, well, you get the mentor once you start working on the project but what we have found is they need to earn the mentor's time. So project management wise, each contributor is responsible for their own project and they can only get the mentor's time once they have met some deliverable that they had promised. Uh, obviously once people start contributing and they reach levels with their mentors, it's time to bring in the cavalry of more mentors. So maybe you need to be up leveled on from the software development point of view so that you can, we can bring your code to higher standards. So we have reviews. Maybe you need more machine learning expertise on your project to up-level your research. So we try to bring a network of mentors, but you only get their time once you have reached a level. Uh, and that is helped through gated reviews. You have gated reviews step-by-step. Step. Finally, you have to go through quantifiable metrics, both TRL level wise, as well as on a machine learning uh, level wise. Uh, in you know whatever metrics you're trying to build in precision recall and F measure, but also what is the status of your project? Has it been, uh, can it run it as a pip install packet so others can reuse your work? Uh, so we, we keep some metrics on their software uh, maturity. We obviously, once it has reached a level, get the stakeholder involved. For example, we have been working with the NASA impact team uh, and uh, the contributors got their time once they had some level. And then finally, if it's reaching a level to write a paper, well, you might have never written a paper before in life. So you get guidance on doing that. And then what we find is that because this is a high value public problem, it's really a good motivation. So the motivation keeps continuing that if I've developed this, I want to get this deployed. 
So what is the path towards that deployment? So we try to paint that big picture and how you are contributing towards that. Obviously, over time, the mentees become mentors for others because they have gone through this journey. So our network of mentors is just increasing. And keep in mind, these are all volunteers. And obviously, how cool is it to say, hey, you deployed something that is helping in flood forecasting or helping scientists at NASA. That's cool, right? So let me pick up some case studies and that will maybe put some paint on uh, whatever I have said so far. So the problem we are going to solve is atmospheric scientists, when they have to work on remote sensing problems, sometimes they need to start with a data set. So for example, I need a data set of hurricanes or of wildfires around the world or of oil spills. So before I work on a problem on oil spills, I need to have the data of oil spill, but chances are you might just not have that to begin with. And keep in mind, so the problem we are trying to solve is given an image of a particular phenomenon, get images that match that phenomenon from the entire earth, right? Uh, this is basically a problem of uh, calculating a metric distance in embeddings in AI and returning it back. Doesn't sound as hard, unless you know the part that first of all, this is 20 years of earth data, that's 35 petabytes that this needs to work with. The second problem is your ImageNet pre-trained networks are not going to work here. Uh, this is 35 petabytes of unlabeled data, there is no label. So you didn't have a classifier to begin with. So how can we attack this problem? So this was the problem and we are really motivated by it. And uh, we, we are going around in high schools talking about AI and this program and a few high schoolers said, you know, we just graduated out of high school. We want to tackle it. Only issue, we don't know AI. We said, don't worry about it. We'll take you through the program. So the students, we gave them a curriculum to learn AI. Uh, it took them actually three weeks to upskill on that part. And then uh, we also gave them a challenge to read medium posts on remote sensing and AI and summarize it. And based on how they summarize it is how we gave them the projects to know, you know, who's more mathematical, who's already more good in code. And here are some of the results that we started getting. So uh, these are a couple of projects all the way from building the reverse image search engine UI to the results that we can get to improving the AI training by ATX to filling the empty spots that you see in remote sensing images in areas where satellites don't go to how to build a representation with SimCLR using unlabeled data, and even how to balance unlabeled data are a couple of problems that people solve. So I'll fast track through a couple of uh, examples. So here's one example of uh, built by Abhigya and Mike. Mike, for background, uh, is a teacher for school students who does not know coding. He heard about this problem and he started learning Python and he started learning AI. And month by month, in after about three months, 90 days, he was already contributing on the project like this. And as you can see, the person searched for a harbor and got results back from the harbor. Keep in mind that many of this, these images do not have a pre-trained network. Another example from Rajiv, who took an image, and when you usually use general convolutional networks, you get back images which were activated by the biggest thing in the image. And usually the biggest thing is the grass in this example. I will take a pause. Cool. Uh, so usually in deep learning, when you do uh, nearest neighborhood search, you get things which get activated. And as you can see, these images have the grassy field, but nothing else in common, right? But what Rajiv did is broke down this image in subparts and did a weighing scheme for each one of these parts. And now you can see you get things which have grass and horses at the same time. In fact, the coolest thing is in normal convolutional networks, you cannot count when you're doing, doing nearest neighbors, but his system could count that. And this is a remarkable result, which has value beyond just uh, you know, earth science. Another example is these empty spots that you see on worldview that, uh, well, those empty spots being that this part of the earth has, does not have the data on that particular day. And that's great, except with one problem, that CNNs pay the most attention to this part if you do not have, if you have unlabeled data. So when you search on an image like this forest, 
which has this black part, this empty path, you get back images which do not look at this rest of the image at all, but only at that black part. So the images that we returned back were, were incorrect. They were all of different categories. On the other hand, uh, Sarah and Esther, they built a system to fill back images by things around in their neighborhood so that the CNN, the convolutional neural network, well, it gets full. It's like an invisibility cloak. And uh, the results basically went back and the image, the CNN started to pay attention to rest of the image. Here are examples and believe it or not, they had empty parts in these, all of these images, but to a naked eye, you might not have observed that. So that's pretty cool. Here's another example of unlabeled training. So taking 2,100 images of UC Merced without labels and coming up with a CNN representation of it using same CLR, and then giving it barely under 5% of the data. And as you can notice, a normal convolutional network with 5% can barely train. But with this particular system, uh, uh, it's already getting close to 50% accuracy. And that's the power of giving problems to people who are just motivated at solving. So we built a pipeline of what needs to be solved. And each one of these uh, green parts is like an individual tool that we are putting on GitHub. You know, it has CI, CD uh, built in and checks built in so that the time by the time it becomes public, we have something that community can trust. Uh, and each one of these is essentially a simple tool that you can use even if you did not know Python, because you can use it on your command line. Most of them are either pip installable tools or command line tools. And lucky for us, six of these uh, contributors Actually, 10 of these contributors have papers published at COSPAR itself. So do check out their presentations. But the interesting part again is they did not know AI and they were many of them were starting as high schoolers. Uh, and one of them did not even know Python. It was an English teacher, so it wasn't even coding background, but really involved in this area. Another really great example is the CAMS detection pipeline, uh, which is for meteor detection. So the problem is we have a scientist who uh, started uh, the cameras for all sky surveillance. And the idea is that Peter Jenskins, he goes up to an observatory, observes the night sky, videos of the night sky, and then manually finds if this was a meteor shower or not. And he's doing this painfully since 2010, manually. That's a lot of effort. Essentially, as you see in the left and the right, is it a bird? No. Is it a plane? No. It's a Superman? No. It's a meteor or not. That's the problem. So during Frontier Development Labs, the work done in this area was, hell, this is an unexplored problem. Can we automate it by building a model to detect this, get the data, and uh, train an AI model? And that was done during FDL. But the fun started post-FDL. That's where the problems become you know, outside in open source. So automating this pipeline, uh, building a central processing of this by you know, uh, publishing the pipeline developed at FTL into a higher software quality standard, but more importantly, building a visualization tool. And this is the visualization tool that came out of post FTL. Exciting, right? But because of visualizing it, more people got involved in putting camera network to give that data and uh, to uh, improve more things. Uh, so for example, this tool was eventually responsible for the uh, detecting the most number of meteors in NASA's 54 year history, uh, 58 years history. Uh, and uh, more interestingly, now people from industry, uh, as this project is being you know, evolved, uh, people from the industry all the way from veterans who are 10 years working in the side of design uh, in software engineering are contributing, take this to the next level. And on the other hand, we have people from Nigeria, uh, a mechanical engineering student who does not have, who goes to a cyber cafe to code and deploy this uh, is working. So it's the, the citizen scientists that we are bringing under the one umbrella to build tools like this, to go and able to search for meteors on earth is simply amazing. And uh, as you can see, this takes expertise from people who are in all sides 
and we need those contributors. And so my message to you is to join us at SpageML. We have affinity networks from disaster response to astrobiology to earth sciences to lunar exploration and see how we can turn those research papers into actual deployed projects and also increase the state of art in uh, the space ML community. So uh, I would love to invite you to space ML. And the question is, how do you join? Well, you join in at this particular link on bit.ly. So thanks for joining us today. And I hope you see at space ML. Thank you.